Hello! And, well, this is going to be an interesting one, but we'll see what happens. We will see. Equitable London Treaties. Sloops and other ships. And for this, I have been joined by the floppy research assistant who just banged himself on the head. So I'm just going to pat him. I don't know. No sense of perce perception on that. A uh, sense of depth perception on that dog. None at all. So, sloops and other ships. Okay, this is an interesting point of the treaty system. Because this is where you start to get some really quite equitable ideas enter in. But you also get some issues. Now, as you can see, this is number mm, five in the London series. And therefore, I am going to, because as I said many times, give a quick preview of the reasonings behind the changes I'm making. But then I'm going to launch into the changes of how and why it could become equitable. And I am going to give you an official rant alert. Yes, this is a rant alert. This video is likely to include ranting. Now, I'm going to try and keep that ranting as academic as possible, but it is going to be frust born from frustration. With the powers that be and some of the absolutely moronically stupid, short-sighted, insanely idiotic ideas they decided to pursue. And mostly this is stuff which is going to involve me probably being mad against the British government, but there are a few other governments involved as well. Now, this is a speaker class. Now, this is something which I have absolutely no problems saying how good it is. You'll notice it has torpedoes fitted. you also notice that the Italians tried to claim it was roughly 600 tons in, um, in standard displacement. It's a torpedo boat. Not a destroyer, it's a torpedo boat. But for the Mediterranean, it's fine. And cranking out these in by the dozen is a very sensible policy to make for any nation. And you can do it with no limits. This is the trick. This is where we are. Now today. All things being well is the 11th, I think. Yep, it's the 11th. And as the 11th is a Saturday, and we are technically not doing anything, but that's also a free day where we might be checking stuff in. So who knows? But I hope you've enjoyed that uh, the videos have come out. And I hope everything's gone to plan. So, why am I combining treaties? Well, as I've said many times now, the Second London Naval Treaty, the 1926 Treaty, doesn't really count. It's a great idea of showing the intentions and the oeuvre and the desire of people to move forward and have a world of peace. After all, there had been a war to end all wars. No, the reality is different. So what have I done to make the treaties work? Well, I've left the Washington Treaty as is. There's no point changing it at this point. Otherwise, I would be just building off my own equitable treaty, at which point there isn't really need for a London equitable treaty because there's already an equitable treaty in place which works. And to change the style of decisions made, well, I need to make a couple of political changes. I've not got rid of the Wall Street crash, but I've had suggested a more Keynesian policy of intervention and construction. And I've gone with governments who are more likely to actually do some intervention, i.e. Emmanuel Smith, in the, Alfred Emmanuel Smith in the United States, and Stanley Baldwin in the UK. Intervention in terms of actually investing in defence construction, or in the case of Smith, intervention at all. Hoover is... Hoover is, well, Hoover. This is Bridgewater. She's a thousand and forty-five tons. Britain builds a couple of her. <clears throat> they could have built a couple of dozen. 
It could have. She'd be pretty darn useful in World War II. Let's be honest. What does she spend most of World War II doing? The Oceanic Convoys. So. Here is the London Treaty as it pertains to these ships. Now, again, there's no limitation. There's only limitations on capital ship production, not everything else. And, in fact, there's this specific part of Article 8. Subject to any special agreement uh, which may submit them to limitation, the following vessels are exempt from limitation. Naval service combined vessels of 600 tons standard displacement and under. No limits. Naval service combatant vessels exceeding 600 tons, but not exceeding 2,000 tons, sand displacement, provided they have none of the following characteristics. Mount a gun above 6.1 inches. Mount more than four guns above 3 inches. Are designed or fitted to launch torpedoes. Are designed for a speed greater than 20 knots. Naval service vessels specifically build as fighting ships, which are employed on fleet duties or as troop transports in some other way than as fighting ships, Provided they have none of the following characteristics. Mount a gun above 6.1 inch. Mount more than four guns above three inch. Designed or fitted to launch torpedoes. Are designed for a speed greater than 20 knots. Are designed for... Uh, are protected by armor plate. Are designed or fitted to launch mines. Are fitted to receive aircraft on board from the air. So, your ship on the 2,000 tons can have armor plate. Your ship over 2,000 tons... Uh, well, your other ship mm, can't have, to, uh, have armor plate. Mounting more than one aircraft or launching apparatus on the center line, or two, one on each broadside, if fitted with any means of launching aircraft into the air, are designed or adapted to operate at sea more than three aircraft. In simple terms, and I mean this in the cutest and simplest way, there is no limit on ships you can build which are under 2,000 tons and 20 knot speed. No limit. So if you're a nation, I don't know, who's obsessed with a submarine threat and really worried about submarines, well, what you could do is go, well, am I getting enough destroyers to deal with submarine threat? No. I could do a match build, though, each year, and I could build these ships which are designed for 20 knots of speed. They're designed for... But I have turbine sets in, which might be the same as the sets I'm fitting to destroyers. And well, their hull's not designed. They're not designed to go more than 20 knots, but if they end up going more than 20 knots, fine. And they're not designed for torpedoes, but that really doesn't bother me because they carry guns and they can carry depth charges and they can carry ASDIC. Just think World War II starts. And a government which has taken advantage of this as a bit of a job creation program has not only built up the uh, built up the industry which supplies turbines and engine machinery to shipyards um, to double what they would be normally building because they've been building so many and alongside the destroyers possibly have been building these in countries as far around the Commonwealth in the case of Britain because well they could because there's no limit so they could use them to build up the Royal Indian Marine, the Royal Australian Navy, the Royal New Zealand Navy, the Royal South African Navy, uh, the Royal Canadian Navy could all be building these domestically and also learning how to operate them. And um, you suddenly have a scenario where, yes, we have a submarine threat, but have you seen how many convoy escorts we already have in service? Because let's say we've been building 16 submarines a year. Well, we've been building 16 of those a year as well. And you can go down and go, well, look, Alex, it's also these boats. These are the lovely things. And I designed this slide specifically to be able to do this. No point putting text there, but the only way I can get the pictures big enough for you to really see is if I do this. So that's why it's designed that way. Alco, Higgins boats. Now, yeah, they don't come. You, you don't really want to get the smaller craft. In service till close to the period because you're still upgrading and producing better and better and more powerful aircraft engines, especially for these. But you can again churn out as many of these as you like. 
and the actual construction of them does tend to improve them. So again, you could have from 1930 onwards have been churning out home defense flotillas. You could have had flotillas based in, you could have had flotillas in, uh, I don't know, in Malaysia and Singapore, manned by locals. You could have had all sorts of these ships all over the place. And yes, you're going to say, well, that costs money, but they don't cost that much relatively money. And yes, they're defensive, but they're going to expand your defensive capabilities quite dramatically. They're going to increase the amount of industry you have building small and light arms, which is quite useful. They're going to increase your torpedo production because you're going to need to increase the torpedo production to produce service them, which means you have more infrastructure for that. And they're going to increase your aircraft engine production because, well, it's aircraft engines going into them. It's another source of income to help those aero engine manufacturers, which again might give you a boost in engine and horsepower. It's an interventionist policy, but if you're following the Keynesian and if you're following preparation, thinking that you're going to have war in roughly 10 years, which from 1932 they actually admit they're going to when they get rid of the 10-year rule, but honestly they've been staring at that in the face for a while, especially with Japan. <laughs> this was almost a very different rant because there is someone who's recently done a major comment in response to me uh, elsewhere on YouTube. Which was basically, oh no, no, the British were not thinking about war with Japan. Their ships aren't, have the wrong, aren't big enough guns. And a few other things. Some actually ideas which almost sa which sound viable until you flip them on their head. And actually look at them from the British perspective. But that gets me accused of being very biased British if I start arguing with people who are arguing it. But let's face it this way. There is more than one way to skin a cat, although, frankly, who would want to, I do not know. And if anyone tries to skin the poodle, there will be definitely one of these will be dropped on their heads. But more importantly, there are lots of options when there is no restriction for navies and for nations to build up. You are scared of a threat, you could build up your security against it. Again. We'll talk, we've talked before about the destroyer production the British do. We've talked before about the destroyer production the Americans do. The destroyer production every navy does. No. Britain, they are growing the S class, the U class, the T class. They eventually get the P class. All sorts of something. Plus, their uh, their submarines they already have in service. They are increasing as many numbers of submarines as they can. They know the reality of submarine threat. They're scared of the submarine threat. Admittedly, they're less scared of it in 1935 than they're going to make out, because let's be honest, most of the German submarine conduction, as we've discussed before, doesn't actually come of it, isn't actually available in 1939, not even really available in 1940. It comes in later in the war. But if you're scared about it, if you're considering all the economics and trade you have to cover, has the British Empire, British Commonwealth. Building these sloops would have made so much sense. And we haven't even got into the biggest culprit. Hello, Japan. You are another exposed island nation. You are planning a war of conquest. You are doing all the deception you can over various projects. Are you... Honestly saying, me, telling me, it's beyond the wit of Japan to design a ship which looks like it's 2,000 tons and is designed not for a speed not greater than 2,000 knots, that they cannot use for anti-submarine warfare and cannot use to put torpedoes in? You could theoretically have built a lot of these pre-war. And they could have had a huge knock-on effect for the war. So why don't they get built? Now, I know, some people are going to turn around and go, well, you know, small ships, they can't be easily upgraded. But we're talking about ships the same size as destroyers. We would upgrade them throughout World War II. 2,000 tons is actually bigger than a destroyer. We Most of the sloops and ships I've shown have been less than 2,000 tons, but most of the ones I show will be a lot less than 2,000 tons. But let's be honest, if it's allowed to be up to 2,000 tons, that's bigger than a tribal class destroyer is officially allowed, or any of the destroyer leaders. They're allowed 1,850 tons. 
Now, admittedly, it's going to be quite underarmed for a vessel that size, so you might not go with a vessel that size, but, you know, you can think about it. Again, the same categories exist in the 1936 jersey. Although, it's now symbol down to mounting a gun with a caliber exceeding 6.1 inch, are designed or fitted to launch torpedoes, are designed for a speed greater than 20 knots. So you now have no limit, theoretically, on the number of guns below 6 inches you can fit. By 1936. Ooh. Why do I have a feeling they're going to be a whole slew of escorts with double four, with three double 4-inch guns? That makes sense. Depth charges, some 40mm pom-poms, space for radar, space for ASDIC, and just churn them out. You have the designs in 1936, we have the sloop designs going around, we have the Egret class, we have that eventually, and the Bitten and the Egret and etc, and they become the Black Swan class, so we have the designs going around. And you have no limitation on them. No limitation on how many you can have. No tonnage limit, no total limitation at all. It's all individual limitation as, as it is. You can have as many as you like. So. And I know this is going to upset those who accuse me of being very biased to British. But let me put it this way to you. This is a continuation of a policy which existed under the Washington Treaty. Under the Washington Treaty, as I've talked about before and I'll be talking again, there is no limit for any ships under 10,000 tons in terms of numbers. Then you get the London Treaty, no limit for ships of on 2,000 tons and under 20 knots. Learn less design for less than 20 knot speed. All these things. If you as a nation are not prepared for an anti submarine war, a global convoy war, in 1939, it is no one's fault but your own. It's not the treaty's fault. The treaty is responsible for many things. They're responsible for problems of destroyers. They're responsible for problems of cruisers. They're responsible for problems of capital ships, which should actually be battleships and battle cruisers. They're responsible for issues with aircraft carriers, because let's be honest, if you had the, if they had the tonnage allowance, then everyone would be building probably something equivalent to a Midway or a Malta. Why? The British will be slightly more armour, slightly less aircraft, because they want their aircraft carriers to be slightly more survivable. The Americans would be slightly less armour, slightly more aircraft, because they have more space to exchange for survivability. That's the thing. Britain Pacific operations will be going through the South China Sea, East China Sea. They're going to be in range of land air bases. And if they're operating Mediterranean, they're going to be in range of land air bases. So that affects the style of carrier you're going to build. If the Americans are operating in the Pacific, they're going through the center of the Pacific. If they're going through the Atlantic, they're going through the central Atlantic. There is a difference in how you operate and how you design your carriers to deal with that scenario. That's the reality. That is what affects things. And then once you boil down and go, you aren't going to give you the tonnage limitation to do something which is a vax or proximity of both, you then get the divergence. You get the British going and building what they build, and the Americans building what they build. And neither is better than the other, neither is right, neither is wrong. They are making the ship the best they can for their circumstance. However, both those nations could build as many of these as they liked. They could build as many of those sloops as they like. America could have had a humongous Coast Guard with 2,000 ton cutters. They could have done. All prepped up and ready for anti submarine war and protecting their coasts. There are no limitations. That's one of the reasons why that tr system is put in that re into the treaties. It's written into the treaties for the US Coast Guard, for Britain to have the sloops it wants, and to keep, uh, have these escorts. 
it's it's one of the reasons it's there. And yet still we don't take advantage of it. Italy tries to get their Xenon under the six hundred tons because uh, it's claimed their Xenon less than six hundred tons because they want to fit them with torpedoes. And then there's no limitations, but the same as this MTV. This is a fair mile D, by the way. So, what do we do? Well, I've put this slide up many, many times, but for starters, there's an equi uh, uh, we can adjust the equal ratio. That's normal policy. But there is no ratio necessary in this. There is no limitation, so there is no ratio. You could have had a consistent economic boost for the UK, consistent boost for the Treaty Party in Japan, if they'd been pushing it, and a stronger position for France and the UK posture when dealing with Mussolini and Hitler, could have all been provided by this the whole way through. The whole way through, Britain could have been churning out sloops. They're designed for a speed of 20 knots. So then maybe they have one turbine set and one propeller. Put in two turbine sets and two shafts, and you have the load you need for a destroyer. Woohoo. There are many options you could have done that would have kept, A, the destroyer turbine industry going at a far greater pace than it was with the existing destroyer of orders, which would have knock-on effects for the turbine industry of larger ter on in terms of larger scale production, because the turbine design is to an extent scalable, and effort and energy made to refine and improve in one section of turbines will have in knock on impacts in other areas. You could have kept shipyards more shipyards going, because let's be honest, sloops two thousand tons can be built in anywhere. You pick a shipyard, you can build it there. You could have been building those ships in Commonwealth countries for Britain. For America, you could have been building them in states all around, all over the place as a job and yard creation program. They don't need to be doing them a lot. You can keep a yard going with a very small order flow, but it, what it needs is it needs that flow of orders. Every single country in the world has the same option in the treaties. That was put in there because of the British fear of submarines. It was put in there because the Americans didn't want the Coast Guard to be restricted by naval treaties when they saw the Coast Guard as a maritime security force. It was put in there because of the lessons of World War I with anti-submarine warfare and the flower class stoops which were critical to it. It's there for them to take advantage of. This is not a problem of the treaty. This is a problem of the governments implementing the treaty. And yes, in under this decision, I've changed Stanley Baldwin to take over instead of Ramsey McDonald. Do I think he'd have taken advantage of it? No, because he'd been Prime Minister before, he's Prime Minister after. He doesn't take advantage of it. Does it matter if it's Smith, if it's Smith, or if it's Hoover, no. Because none of them have taken advantage of it. There are problems with these treaties. Deep, real problems in them because of the way they're phrased, because of the way they're thought about. But, and I say this again, from the Washington Treaty onwards, you could have built as many, to up to 2,000 tonne Surface escorts as you wanted. Now, I don't think you'd have built a 2,000 ton of them myself. I think it'd probably be about a 1,500 ton vessel, which would mean the same size and displacement as your destroyers. But it's a destroyer sized hull where you're only worried about going 20 knots and you're not worried about carrying, to, uh, carrying torpedoes. That's a lot of space for anti submarine warfare gear. That's a lot of space for endu increased endurance, more fuel, 
less crew. That's a ship you can build and pretty much park. Because that's what the British do to an extent with the V&W class. If you think about how they modernise and use them in World War II, well, you could have been building new hulls from 1930, so they'd been available for it to go and operate with Asdik. Boy, you think I'm being very cruel? I was clearing his eye while he was not thinking. Sorry. He was pouring it. It's a non-stop thing, history and life. You only get one shot. You don't get a do-over. You don't get a practice run. This is your one shot. And every single government from World War I, 1919, till 1939, mucked this up. You know why I say 1939 they stopped mucking it up? Because they ordered the flower class corvettes before war even begins. But there again, the treaties don't count at that point. They could have ordered flower class corvettes or more uh, souped up sloops in 1938. They could have ordered them in 1937. Again, think of it from this perspective. The same bittern class, or the same bittern class, Hull that provides the hull for the Egret class and the Black Swans class provides the hull for the Hunt class escort destroyer. So, the reality, therefore, is. So much was actually available to be done, and the governments didn't do it because the governments believed that everyone was as horrified by war as they were, that everyone had the same desire to never fight again. The war to end all wars was something which goes around the English-speaking world and parts of Europe, but what is its real impact beyond there, beyond the Commonwealth, beyond this, you know, as I said before, Japan, but Japan World War I looked quite successful. Admittedly, the treaties afterwards, they don't look successful. They look, they make Japan feel like they're a loser. They were part of the winning team. Then you have, well, then you have America. They go isolationist. They don't join the League of Nations. All the other things which are supposed to back up the war of the Washington Naval Treaty, which are supposed to make it work, they withdraw from. And Britain and France are still shell shocked. Germany wants to revise history. Italy feels they didn't get their just desserts from World War One. There are lots of revisionist powers. And you had this option. You had this option sitting there which they didn't go through with. You had this option sitting there which would allow them to have built ships that could have done the escort role, which could have provided protection for places like Scarpa Flow. Again, it's one of those things. The Royal Navy could have built as many patrol boats as they wanted to be wandering around Scarpa Flow. So you'd have never lost Royal Oak, the modernised R class. You wouldn't have lost it because there would have been enough patrol ships wandering around. And before someone says, well, you know, how many would enough have been enough? Imagine there's, I don't know, 16 patrol boats wandering around and on duty up there, all roughly in the thousand ton range. They could have had them. Yeah, they can only do 20 knots, but they carry the full, uh, they carry Asdick, they carry depth charges. How much more complicated is that going to make your submarine's mission? 
how much does that turn your submarine's mission from being a very difficult task, but actually doable, because there are breakdowns in defences, to a mission where, well, there's constant patrols of top of the ships with their Aztec on active, wandering around, bashing the water with full lots of sound. Submarines are not a wonder weapon. They are an amazing, amazing system. Don't get me wrong, but they're not a panacea. They're not invincible. We know that because the Battle Atlantic ultimately it was won. Yes, the Type Twenty Ones, if that had come in, it would have caused trouble. But there would, it, it, as with every phase in the Battle Atlantic, it would ebb and flow. The Type Twenty One would come in, that would cause trouble, and then counters would come about to it. It wasn't uncounterable. And to an extent, they already had the counters for it. They just need, would need to more of them. So, submarines in 1939, 1940, Donitz has a lot less submarines to play with than he would have later in the war. He has more of these going around in many ways as Chanel boots. And the reason they can have as many of those as they want is because they're 78.9 tons standard, so they can build as many as they like, and there's no restrictions. You will sit there and go, yeah, but they're terribly weak boats. Still not something you want to take, you, you want to think about. And not something you particularly want to fight. Again, you want to maximize the trouble for Japan in Malaya, or etc. You just follow through the flotilla defense doctrine, which Jackie Fisher wanted to put in around the Empire, where you had flotillas of torpedo boats and aircraft all around the world, all around the Empire, that would act as local deterrents, defense, because they'd be a trip waffles, which could cause trouble. So you had to take enough equipment to make sure you could beat them, because if you didn't, then you'd be in trouble. And that raises the cost of operating. Deterrence is often a combination of both raising the cost of any of an enemy's operation and of delivering a different cost. Making sure they understand that you're not only going to raise the cost of doing the initial operation, but there's going to be a follow-on cost when the response comes. These vessels are useful for that. Now, under the Equitable Washington Treaty, of course, my proposal was build. Well, guess what my proposal is going to be this time. And this is HMS Periwinkle, by the way. Before people get into, because this is usually the point at which people go, well, these small ships, they wouldn't have been much use for the Atlantic. This is a flag class corvette. It's periwinkle. It's 925 long tons or 940 tons in standard. They were eminently useful in the Battle Atlantic. And yes, they get replaced by frigates, but they're not much bigger. And again, 20 knots. 20 knots. You need a hull that can take Aztec. You need guns that can deal with aircraft and torpedo boats and surface submarines. You need depth charges. Preferably, you need to develop the system which replaces depth charges, the anti-submarine warfare mortar, and eventually the homing torpedo. But, you know, depth charges will do. Depth charges and Aztec will do, because if you have enough ships with Aztec, and this is the point, okay? What's the big problem for the Royal Navy and the first phase of the Battle Atlantic? It's having enough escorts, because you need one escort to be maintaining Aztec contact with the quarry, while the other does a depth charge run. So for every quarry, you need about two, uh, you need about two escorts. You need numbers of hulls in the water. 
Now we've been we've been talking about this on bilge pumps lately, and we've been talking about another thing. This is a case of towed array sonars from unmanned surface vessels are going to be the future. They are going to be the future of the small escort for anti-submarine warfare. Think of how many you can carry. Think of how many can be out there. Providing sensor data and triangulation. A submarine can hide. But can it hide from... All streaming along quietly around the convoy? Coordinating with... A ship which has the data to process it, uh, the data, uh, the, the capabilities to process the data coming from those ships and synthesize and combine all of them. So the minor sound, oh, hang on, it's picked up by all six. Here's its bearing, triangulate it. Send out helicopter, drop torpedo, or drop sonar, uh, drop, and put in its dipping sonar. Listen, maybe ping. Well, it works similarly when we go back. If you have more escorts, you can make a big difference on the early convoys. If you make a big difference on the early convoys, if there are issues for the submarines and they're not racking up those early kills, you can have a big long-term impact for the war as a whole. I've made the point in previous videos that in world wars, especially long-term wars, wins and losses are cumulative. Losing ships has an impact for operations as it goes on. Winning has an impact for operations as it goes on. The more, uh, the more escorts you have, well, let's put it this way, the more uh, corvettes you have available, sl sloops you have available to escort ships and escort convoys, the less you need to worry about destroyers for it, in which case your destroyers can concentrate on escorting the faster warships, the carriers, etc., which means your carriers have more escorts. And if your carriers have more escorts and your capital ships have more escorts, you lose less of them to submarines. And if you lose less of them to submarines, you have more of them to do other operations with. It's cumulative. As it boils down to, there are limitations, but subject to any special agreements, submit them, uh, which may submit them to limitation, the following vessels are exempt from limitation. You can put as many of them in like. And then in 1936, you get minor and auxiliary vessels. And small craft. These don't exceed 100 tons. For some reason, it goes down to 100 tons. But again, the Schnell boot, 78.9 tons standard. This is HMS Lagom. She's a river class. She's a World War II, no treaty limitations produced anti-submarine warfare frigate. One of the best vessels produced during World War II for anti-submarine warfare. HMS Lagom is a good ship. 1,370 tons in standard. One thousand three hundred and seventy tons standard. Top speed twenty knots. You could have built her before prior to World War Two. There is nothing on her which is treaty limited. She could have been you could have been churning out ships like this. From 1930, you could have been churning out from 1922. You could have been churning out from 1919. Every year, you could have been building a dozen 1,500-ton oceanic escorts. And no one would have stopped you. No treaty would have limited you. Unless someone chose to change those treaties. And I don't see how they would. So we're talking earlier, I was mentioning the Royal Navy could have built escorts like this as they were building their destroyers. They build roughly 16 destroyers a year, they order, between 1930 and 1939. 
So you could have had roughly 160, 1,500 tons surface uh, escorts built. Now, let's say you assign eight to each convoy. That's 20 convoys you could have escorted. Hang on, though. That's just the building if you're building British, uh, going for the British. What happens if you decide to build some in Canada and some in Australia and some in India and some in South Africa? Okay, you might build a lot less. You might, over that same period, only build 40 in each of those, but that's another 160. You could even get some out of New Zealand, maybe another 20. Wow, that's got us up to, what, 340 ships? 340 first-rate oceanic convoy escorts in service prior to World War II. Imagine the impact that would have had on World War II. And this is not a scenario where you can go, well, did they have the infrastructure to do it? They did. Did they have the industry to do it? They did. Did they have the money to do it? These ships didn't cost that much and frankly would have been a lot cheaper to build prior to the war. Because during wartime there's massive inflation. Um, did they have the personnel to do it? Well, they could have made them reserve crews like they would do planning with other ships and that would have been fine. They had the reserve personnel. Would it have built up the infrastructure and other things in the wider Commonwealth? Yes, it would have. Would it have been considered a threatening move to make? Well, let's put it this way. Think about it from this perspective. Someone turn, if you turn around to go, someone, well, you building these ships, which can only shield your commerce, they can't be used to attack me because they don't carry torpedoes and they don't carry a lot of heavy guns, is threatening to me. It's basically saying, well, me carrying this base, you just responding to me carrying this baseball bat by wearing a suit of body armor is threatening to me. It doesn't really work, does it? You're carrying the baseball bat in the first place. So anyone who says it's threatening, and it would be a threatening maneuver on part of British, wouldn't. it actually would have been considered possibly most peaceful. Now, what have I changed? Well, the ratio, there's no numerical limit, so I'm not changing anything there. I have changed a couple of things. I've gone for 24 knots because they were considering that. And the reason that is because 20 knots will provide an excellent convoy escort but not a fleet escort. You can't go for 30 knots because whilst that provides a fleet escort, at a certain point, that's pretty much edging into destroyer. But the main trouble, especially with some of these escorts, was catching up with the fast convoys, which is why you had to use destroyers for the fast convoys. Four extra knots and their top speed gets you to the catching those fast convoys with a reasonable ability. So that's why I've pushed it up to 24 knots. And that was debated at the time, so I feel perfectly historical going with that. Uh, not to carry guns, not uh, not to carry torpedoes, not to carry guns bigger than 5.1 inch. So they're limited to destroy guns, but I felt that would have actually made sense and been uh, uh, by uh, suggesting that they could have up to 6 inch guns, you've actually put yourself into a problematic position. It does make it to an extent threatening for them to be built, because could do things with them. More than six guns greater than three inch. Well, again, that's mainly because I looked at the sloop design and went, that's what they end up with. So they'll do. Have no armor plate. Be designed, fitted to launch mines. Be an aircraft carrier. Yeah, that works. Design fitted to launch mines is one of the things of you can say, oh, these ships aren't designed to launch mines, they don't have rails, but you can soon adapt most ships to being a mine, la mine layer or mi uh, uh, mine layer if you want them. No armor plate. Well, again, if you really wanted to, and this is something to put out there. Britain, at the beginning of World War II, magically transforms most of its county class cruisers into having a full four inch armor belt. It's not beyond the wit of Britain, sorry, fly, not beyond the wit of Britain or wit of any nation to design ships that are built without armour 
to have armor ready, able to be fitted to them. Although, what, how much armor you'd want to fit them, I'm not sure. Um, maybe a little bit of deck armor to deal with attacks from the air, because they're supposed to be convoy escorts. You don't really want... The, these ships don't have torpedoes. They're not going to fight cruisers or anything large than that. If they uh, do, they're, they don't have any chance. So don't give them armor to do that. Bit of armor, a bit of uh, armored bulkheads to protect against torpedo damage, maybe. But it's up to you. Uh, it'll be up to you as a nation. And no limit, because that doesn't matter. And this is a Black Swan class. 1,250 tons standard. Again, okay. So roughly 91.29 meters long. Um, beam for the original Black Swans was 11.4 meters. Uh, the modified ones were 11.73 meters. And the draft is 3.4 meters. They're capable of going a top speed of 20 knots. Well, the, ori uh, the modified... Mm, the, the original have a top speed of 19 knots. The modified have a top speed of 20 knots. And a range of 7,500 nautical miles at 12 knots. Six quick firing four inches in guns in three twin mounts. Four two pounder AA pom poms. Four point five inch machine guns in the originals as well. 12 20 millimeter Oricons in six twin mounts on the modified and later that's added into the originals. And depth charges. 40 on the originals, 110 in the modified design. A very capable little ship. An excellent, absolutely exceptional little ship. All built within treaty limits. Could have been built by the dozen from 1930, from 19, all the way through. And that's the same hunt hull which goes on the hunt class escort destroyers. Same hull. The problem with submarines in World War Two starts off with a lack of escorts to take them, uh, take the battle to them, and protect the, the merchant vessels. And when the numbers build up and the numbers of the submarines build up, then it becomes a technological battle. It doesn't become a case of the escorts are overwhelmed. It becomes a case of the tech, not the tech edge, the, the, the risk edge. You could have not solved the problem, but certainly have alleviated much of the problem of the submarine threat in World War II by simply doing what they were allowed to. In terms of governments could have alleviated much of the problem by simply doing what they were allowed to and building escorts. It is not a treaty problem. It is a not a we don't know there is a problem problem. It is not even a we can't foresee the problem problem it's not a this is going to cost oodles and oodles of money problem it's a we don't want to see there's going to be a problem that we know is going to be a problem and we'll hope it's going to be someone else is going to have to deal with it so we're letting someone else deal with it they're building destroyers they're building everything else because they are limited by treaty i'm almost tempted to say that actually in that you should actually produce a limitation in, in, in treaty because if they were legally limited to the same number of ships as they have destroyers, then they build them. Because that's the thing. The interesting thing about the treaties, the British build up to the maximum tonnage the whole time. The Americans build up to the individual tonnage. Um, but the British build up numbers tonnage. And overall tonnage. And if you'd had an overall tonnage limitation, perhaps the British would have built more of these ships. Perhaps the French would have built some more. And the Italians, well, the Italians built a fair number as well, but the Japanese might have built some. Perhaps that's the problem. 
Perhaps because they didn't have a limitation on the number they could build, they just didn't think to build any. <sighs> Sloops and other ships. And I haven't even got into the discussion of auxiliaries, okay? Tankers are auxiliaries. Um, troop transports are auxiliaries. You can build as many of those as you like. Again, fast troop transports, fast tankers. You can build, you can arm, you can prep for war. It's actually some very fair work in there, and yet they don't pursue it. Why? It's keeping up with the Joneses. It's my theory. It's actually my theory in the end. The governments, A, don't want to believe there's going to be a war. And so what they do invest in is the stuff which they have to invest in in order to keep up with the Joneses. Because everyone has a treaty limitation, and if they don't do that, then they're going to fall behind other people, and they can't afford that. Whereas Article 8 doesn't give them any limitations. So there's no need to keep up the Joneses, because you can all have as many as you need. And as a rule, Britain still had the most of them. There just weren't that many. I could have built a lot more. It's always easier to expand industry and infrastructure in peacetime than in war. It's easier to grow your production base in peacetime than in war. And if you've grown your production base in peacetime, it's in a better footing to be grown in wartime. So, even Winston Churchill doesn't come out of this one looking good, because trust me, he weren't pushing for these ships to be built either in the 1920s and the 1930s. No one was really pushing for them. There are a few admirals, thankfully Henderson included, who work on programs to try and get them uh, get them through. There are a few admirals in the US, a few admirals in the UK, a few admirals in various combinations, uh, Gulf nations who are pushing for these escorts, pushing for these sorts of ships. They are very few, very far between. And they are very unsupported. Right, so, there you go. Tomorrow, well, that's fortifications and submarines. I know it just says fortifications there, but it's submarines and fortifications. I hope you're going to enjoy it. I hope you're going to find it interesting. And yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this. I take off tomorrow. Have fun. Thank you again for all your support, and... Thank you, everyone, for making Canada possible. Hope you're well. Hope you're enjoying life. And, yeah, all the super chats, all the super thanks, all the subscriptions, all the people who've pressed the subscribe and like buttons down there, all the people who've commented, viewed the videos, all the people who've signed up to Patreon. Contribute over PayPal. Thank you. Without you, this trip wouldn't be happening. So, have you enjoyed?